afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to host today's event after the Minsk Accords, How to Overcome the Russian Occupation of Ukraine, organized by the Council on Geostrategy, the newest foreign affairs think tank based in the heart of London and dedicated to making the United Kingdom, as well as other free and open nations, more united, stronger and greener. The Minsk Accords, intended to stop the fighting started by Russia in southeastern Ukraine, have failed, but they still occupy center stage as the only option for peace. Although at the time they averted the risk of all-out war, sporadic violence continues with a constant risk of escalation. And for the moment, the prospects of any real peace deal are slender. Today, we have a wonderful opportunity to discuss this very topic with our prominent panelists. We are joined today by His Excellency Vadim Pristaiko, the Right Honorable Tobias Elwood, Dr. Marga Liotti, and Dr. Alexander Lanoska. His Excellency Ambassador Vadim Pristaiko is the Ambassador of Ukraine to the United Kingdom. He has had an illustrious career in diplomacy and he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine back in 1997. Over the years, he has held multiple diplomatic positions, including the Ukrainian ambassador to Canada and Ukrainian representative to the International Organization of Civil Aviation. He has served as Ukraine's ambassador to the United Kingdom since July 2020. We are also honored to be joined by the Right Honorable Tobias Elwood, who is a member of parliament for Bournemouth East, he currently serves as the chair of the Defence Select Committee in the House of Commons and is also our advisory council member. He was parliamentary under secretary of state for Africa and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office from July 2016 to 2017 and also served as parliamentary under secretary of state for defence veterans, reserves and personnel at the Ministry of Defence from 2017 to 2019. He's also an active army reservist. Dr. Marco Liotti is Honorary Professor of University College London, School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College London, and also our Associate Fellow. He's a top expert in modern Russia, particularly its security, politics, and intelligence services. He has advised and given evidence to a wide range of bodies from the House of Common Foreign Affairs Committee to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Interpol and SHAPE. And finally, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Alexander Lanoska, who is also our Associate Fellow and Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Waterloo, Canada. Dr. Lanoska has worked for the United States Department of Defense and has consulted for Global Affairs Canada. He holds a PhD in philosophy and a master's degree in politics, both from Princeton University. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping rules. Our panelists will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, with His Excellency Ambassador Pristaiko giving introductory remarks first. Then, Dr. Mark Galiotti, Dr. Alexander Lanoska, and the Right Honorable Tobias Elwood will give their speeches. The event will end with a Q&A session. You can ask questions during the whole course of the event, but please do make sure that you indicate your name, your affiliation, and to whom you are addressing your question. So without any further delay, Ambassador Pristaiko, we are looking forward to hearing your introductory remarks. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you very much. And happy to be with you. The most important part in what I was doing for many, many years and how it is relevant to what we're discussing today that I was unfortunately uh, heading Ukrainian negotiation team at the Minsk agreement. We will come to this in a, in a second. I'm, I'm really humbled by this caliber of the experts we have today and the guests, and I hope that Everybody who is joining us online will advance their understanding of the situation around Ukraine. Sorry, my colleagues are saying that you don't have any video, right? We can see you perfectly now. Thank you, sorry, something, something went wrong. Uh, we, we, we hope that uh, the, our common effort will allow people to understand, the, our, our audience to understand what is the situation in, around Ukraine and how conflict is not just taking lives of Ukrainians, but also holding Ukraine as a nation in civilizational development, the tearing the very uh, fragile fabric of Ukrainian society, so vulnerable in a volatile surrounding, with Belarus just a new piece to already complicated the equation. 
Most importantly, we hope that we will discuss the role of Russian Federation in all of this and how we can get out of its brotherly their grip. Who knows, uh, our distinguished panelists might even navigate us all closer to answer on the question of the event itself. An attentive observer might, might right away ask a question, does title precludes, preclude a possibility to overcome the Russian, Russian occupation within a Minsk agreement frameworks? Or this is just the only ritual dance, we're still da dancing, having no better alternative. Again, then someone might, might even get more curious and ask about alternatives, or if we have a chance to get any alternatives, when we are not even looking for one or not even allowing ourselves to open up the minds for the possibility of having such a discussion. Another question, why Minsk II of February 2015 is so sacred that after six and a half years, we're still without much success, are trying to implement an obviously hastily drafted document? Or why for the same sake, we allowed Russians to kill a previous Minsk agreement where they made an obvious mistake of offering a security corridor along Ukrainian-Russia official border and the international surveillance. I'm not going to bore you to death by citing an official party line of how important for everybody the implementation of Minsk agreements and so on and so forth. Also, I'm not going to pile up the numbers of violation of ceasefire regime by opposing forces. All of it you can easily find elsewhere. On the contrary, I will encourage very much an open if you wish, scientific debate of how we get out of this deadlock. Just to launch the exchange, please allow me to quote one paragraph. I, I promise it will be short, but that's not my word. Again, this is the quotation. Starting, Ukrainians are very well aware for that, uh, that for this time being, their country does not really exist. I have said that it could exist in the future. The national core exists. I'm asking the question, as to what the borders, the frontiers should be. And that should be the sub subject for international discussion. The country can be reformed as a confederation with a lot of freedom for the regions to decide things by themselves. Ukraine is right between Russia and the West and geopolitical gravity of both will see dear Ukraine. Until we reach that outcome, the fight for Ukraine will never cease. It may die, die down, it may flare up, but it will continue inevitably. The Minsk agreements, a peace deal signed by Moscow, Kiev, and Russian rebels is an act that legitimized the first official division of Ukraine, end of quote. This piece from the interview to a Financial Times of the person who was adding, I am proud that I was a part of the reconquest. This was the first open geopolitical counterattack by Russia against the West and such a decisive one. So the name of this person is Vladislav Surko, same guy, who led Russian delegation to Minsk to prepare a famous or infamous meeting of Form 94 ended, in, uh, ended up in Minsk agreements. He was the guy with whom I, as a head of Ukrainian team, had to negotiate at a time when our soldiers been bombarded and killed by dozens. I hope I managed by this quote to give you a taste of the atmosphere and total, di totally different mindsets of the parties to negotiations and of the expectations for the Minsk agreement. I hope for the open, as I mentioned, even scientific debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Priestaiko, for your uh, introductory remarks. And without any further delay, Dr. Marco Liotti, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And particularly, I'm delighted to take advantage of the fact that as an independent scholar, I am entirely irrelevant by which I mean that I have no official standing and therefore in some ways I can perhaps talk about some of the things which is harder for people who have, as I say, some kind of a formal role can say. And this is why I definitely want to give, in my opinion, a, a wholehearted answer to the question that we were posed at the beginning and actually say, yes, Minsk is, not just Minsk must die, but Minsk is long, long dead. Now, as Victoria said, the original Minsk Accords were very much responses to specific circumstances at a time when Ukraine was in disarray, in a way it's not at the moment, and at a time when the Russians were threatening direct military escalation. But since then, we have had deadlock. 
I mean, and a deadlock which actually is, is a malign one and one that works not just to the disadvantage of Ukraine, but it also works very much to the disadvantage of all those Ukrainians who are currently within the pseudo states of the so-called People's Republics of Lukansk and, and Donetsk, and who are suffering under the rule of what can only really be described as a collection of thugs and opportunists who clearly have no thought about the uh, futures and prospects of those people under their control. And the problem is that the Minsk agreements makes, make all further discussion sterile. Um, essentially, what it does is it forces everything into being um, tit for tat conversations about the sequencing of different aspects of it, issues which by now are of that best theological importance. They don't matter anymore on the, on the ground. Um, there is a timetable within the Minsk Accords, a timetable that is long since dead. The problem is the fundamental element of the Minsk Accords is that they depend on good faith actors. They depend on trust between the parties. And clearly that is long, long since gone. So, I mean, in this respect, there is no prospect and there has been no prospect for years now of actually Minsk being advanced in its own terms as any kind of resolution to a dispute. That frankly, Moscow has no particular need or desire to see resolved. I don't think that what we're seeing at the moment is, is what Moscow set out for in 2014, not at all. This is plan B or C or D when their more ambitious thoughts, the belief that this was going to be some brief occupation that would demonstrate to Kiev that it had no options to break free of being part of Russia's sphere of influence. I mean, that clearly is over. But nonetheless, they're stuck there. And it's a conflict which costs them, but not costs them enough for them to think about the humiliation of, of withdrawal. So from their point of view, they're happy to keep what Ambassador Pristaiko called the dance going forever. While Minsk is there, the, the usual refrain, as we've heard, is that, well, there is no alternative. Minsk is the only deal on the table. Well, it is on the table. It is the only deal. But as I described it in a piece I wrote for the Council on Geostrategy, it is essentially a rotting corpse that is slumped over the table, not just long since gone, but occupying the space in which any kind of meaningful new negotiations could take place. So something needs to be done. And this is why, in my view, we need to get rid of Minsk. First of all, to break the stalemate, to actually allow there to be the ground, the possibility, only the possibility, but the possibility of some kind of new and meaningful conversation that takes into account the realities of 2021, not of 2015. And secondly, to stop fake equivalence, because at the moment what happens is the Russians point the finger at the Ukrainians and they say, look, you haven't done X and Y, particularly in terms of devolving power to the regions. And the Ukrainians quite understandably say, well, we're not gonna hand over responsibility until we actually have control of our own, own borders. But the point is, again, it creates this illusion that essentially these are just simply two parties with equal amounts of, of right and guilt on their sides. We need to end that. The problem is Ukraine, Kyiv cannot end the accords itself without being painted as the warmonger. France and Germany, who are the main guarantors, the main countries that really are still backing Minsk, seem to be unwilling to, which is why I, my hope is that uh, the UK might be able to fulfill some kind of role, at least in furthering the conversation. But the final point, surely any agreement I sometimes hear is, is better than none. Well, I'm not convinced. As I say, Ukraine today is very different from Ukraine in 2014 and 2015. There is no evidence at all that it's a piece of paper that keeps Russia in check. Instead, it's the fact that Ukraine is now more united, more advanced on its state building pro project than it has been at any point, I would suggest, in its recent history. And the irony is that if anyone is the founding father of modern Ukraine, it's actually Vladimir Putin for giving something that actually everyone unites between. And secondly, well, again, it's not a piece of paper that holds Russian forces back. It's the fact that Ukraine now has a quarter of a million men and women under arms and a military that actually has uh, improved and developed really quite impressively. Is this a force that the Russians could take on? They could. They, they could win a military, military victory. They could not pacify. But above all, they could not do so without massive casualties, which would not play well at home. So again, this is why the world has changed. The world needs to move on 
Minsk needs to move on to allow some kind of conversation that is meaningful for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marco Liotti, Dr. Alexander Lanoske. Uh, thank you so much for having me on this uh, very illustrious panel. It's quite an honor. And my remarks will really echo what Marco just said. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to more or less repeat them, but I'll package them uh, in a way that uh, I hope will still push the debate. So a question as how to overcome the Russian occupation of Ukraine to me can be rephrased in terms of how the war between Russia and Ukraine uh, could come to an end, especially in the Donbass, because of course talking about Crimea uh, brings with it its own set of difficulties. In breaking down the war, or really any war, I find it useful to think in terms of what the war aims are of each side and what would it take for a peaceful settlement not only to emerge, but also to endure with everyone abiding by its terms. But here we have a complication. I think Ukraine's war aims are straightforward enough. It ultimately wants to regain control of its internationally recognized territory, and thus to secure its eastern border with Russia. In other words, some return to the status quo antebellum uh, that existed prior to 2014, of course, with some openness to changing internal political structures in its eastern parts. Russian war aims, in contrast, are trickier to discern and subject to much controversy and by design. Now, part of the trickiness is that Russia has been very opaque being largely in denial that its own forces have been involved directly in the fighting. And so how can we truly discern those war aims of Russia is obfuscating its own role? Now, of course, you can say as some have that Russia does this to ensure that Ukraine uh, remains outside of NATO and does not integrate into various Euro-Atlantic structures. Such arguments, I think, assume that NATO, I mean, that Ukraine would be uh, part of NATO um, had it not been for the war, a big assumption considering that there was a peacetime decision made in 2008 on the part of NATO not to grant a membership action plan uh, because of French and German opposition. Opposition that, as Mark reminds us, still persists to this day in large part because they feel that they are part of the uh, Normandy process and they cannot really um, appear unbiased, however convincing that might be. Now, to me, a more compelling explanation uh, is that Russia is fighting the war because its leaders have a hard time believing that Ukraine truly is a separate nation worthy of statehood and political sovereignty. And so they engage in violence and heavy handed coercion uh, to wrestle back control. And Putin's essay this past week captures this condescending attitude all too well. So really the war and the occupation is a mechanism for control. Now, however one thinks of this assessment, uh, Russia's opaqueness is part of a bigger trend in international politics. International relations scholar Tanisha Fazal has found that since the 1949 Geneva Convention, states have stopped issuing formal declarations of war, as well as concluding formal peace treaties, precisely because states want to avoid responsibility under international humanitarian law. And of, although she does not quite say so herself, one can just as well extrapolate that this would complicate efforts to find an actual resolution. In other words, it is hard to agree to a credible peace if at least one belligerent has been consistently disingenuous about its role. As Russia has not declared war on Ukraine and declarations of war often precede actual peace treaties, the story unfortunately seems to fit uh, too well with what we've seen so far. Yes, there has been uh, the Minsk Accords, but for reasons that Mark has just explained, these were agreements uh, flawed from the outset and continue to be very flawed, largely handicapping Western decision-making, not least because Russia has violated them, obstruct obstructed OSCE monitoring, and has used military force in order to get better terms. I don't think Putin has any interest in withdrawing Russia from Eastern Ukraine, much less Crimea while he is in power. And the only plausible scenario that I can envision in the short term is this, that if there is significant constitutional change in Russia and new leaders do come to power with a genuine interest to reset relations with the West and with Ukraine, then I think the conditions would be right for the war in the Donbass to end. Indeed, every war must end, so it's a matter of time. In the meantime, however, I think Ukraine ought to focus on 
being its better self, improving its own governance and capabilities and enhancing its own image abroad to make itself even more worthy of greater Western assistance. In so doing, it will position itself to be more able to reintegrate occupied territories if and when Russia relents. And even if the conflict persists, Ukraine will still be better off because those uh, reforms will have their own intrinsic benefits. And for their part, Western countries should absolutely no longer equivocate about the value and defense of Ukraine's sovereignty and step up their support accordingly, whether through NATO or even outside of it, as Britain has done through various projects with Ukraine. So, uh, you know, in a bit of a holding pattern to be sure, but I think still we can use this time to build on the sort of successes that Mark has already mentioned to position Ukraine uh, better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander Lenoska. May I please kindly remind everyone when you ask your question, please indicate your role and affiliation. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Elwood, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Delightful to participate in this panel and uh, thank you to the Council on Geostrategy for putting this together. A pleasure to see the Ambassador uh, and my fellow panellists. Um, Dr. Mark, I must contest, I think uh, comments by all of us, including your good selves, actually helps to better understand uh, the issues. I, I certainly know as a politician that we can speak many a time on the floor of the chamber on subjects that we know little about, let alone the details. And, and what we're doing here today is exploring I think some of the, the minutiae, which we must understand if you want to have a solution. So I think what we're doing here today is very important indeed. I was very moved by my own visit uh, to, um, the, to Ukraine, to Kiev, just after the, the Maidan took place, just after uh, the, the huge uprising, uh, basically in response to whether or not the country should be looking west or east. And that was a fantastic journey for me in understanding perhaps the duality, if I can put it right, or the schizophrenia of a nation there where half of it very much was the breadbasket of Europe for centuries, um, mostly looking towards the West. And the other half, going back to Catherine the Great, was very much the industry for the Soviet um, side of things, looking more to the East. And that's a big challenge, I think, for um, uh, the ambassador and uh, uh, his country is to decide which way they want to go. I think he's working out which way he wants to go now, but he looks like he's on the move. Um, <clears throat> the challenge I think for, for us is, is how do we then advance our own interests in following you know, bigger picture stuff after the Cold War in wanting to expand democracy, rule of law, uh, and international standards. And this is the the bigger issue that where Ukraine has become perhaps the ground zero is the West bumping into the East. And we're talking about the Minsk agreements, the accords, the, uh, uh, the order in which things are done. If you solve this, or indeed, if you look at the bigger picture, you know, could this lead to perhaps some sort of reconciliation between the big geopolitical differences that we see between Russia and uh, the West, you know, if, if you're sitting in Moscow and you see this adversary called NATO starting to get ever closer to your own country, you are going to be concerned. If you're going to see this thing called the EU creep ever closer, you are going to be concerned. One of the big uh, takeaways I had from the country, and, and I stand corrected, I've not been there for a little while, was just the power of the oligarchs in that country. I, you know, I was led to believe that about 70, 80% of the GDP was controlled by about uh, 11 people. And whether it was a chocolate magnet or, or you know, whoever it would be, it, you had these great big powerful individuals that not only control MPs, members of parliament, they control the chiefs of the police and so forth. They really did control their region. And it reminded me of King John's time with the barons as well, the relationship between the center and the outside there, how do you, you know, make to, uh, are you able to move that forward? Particularly when you've got this duality of, of, of a country itself, half of it, uh, the rural area in the West, you know, looking towards the West, and certainly the area to the East, looking towards uh, the East. You even had, you know, from the radio and television programs as well, everybody in the East was tuning in to Russian soap operas, you know, because the Ukrainian ones apparently weren't very good. 
And this is the dilemma that we now face, is the fact that Russia is perhaps using this to create their own buffer zone, to create their own protection um, from uh, Western advance. Now, I pose this as this bigger question because the, you know, the point was made, what could the United Kingdom do here? We need an off-ramp here. We need an ability to allow Russia and indeed the West, the UK and, uh, and the United States, a way to reconcile these issues which have never been fully um, appreciated or dealt with after the Cold War. Putin blames the West for the outpouring of billions of dollars uh, after the privatizations that took place in, um, in Russia. And he also is got to the point where he wants to control his own people as well and the messaging too. Well, step back from this and look at the geopolitical direction of travel for the next century. And we have this China, which is just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens if Russia puts itself under the wing of China? For the West, that's a huge challenge this century for us to contain with. This China's might, militarily, economically, technology grows bigger and bigger. We should have as a strategy, a determination of the next decade to turn Russia 180 degrees. So it feels at home with the West. It doesn't feel threatened by either NATO or the EU. And the reason why I mentioned the oligarchs is quite important because if you are an oligarch today and you're operating in a, in a pretty corrupt environment, do you want EU legislation coming in demanding you provide the transparency uh, that is now uh, obligated by any member of the EU? Of course, you'd be hesitant to suddenly want to uh, accept that. But this is a bigger question for Ukraine as to where it wants to go. It's, it's, it's like there's an identity crisis that still itself is on a journey. But the bigger question is to do with Russia. If you solve the Russian threat, I think Russia would be more relaxed about allowing Ukraine then to advance and do its own thinking and its own maturing uh, as well. But I can, you know, I'm happy to be st stood corrected to say that I'm way off the mark here. But I do feel that uh, we should have a different strategy just to seeing Russia as an adversary and nothing else. So, you know, Nord Stream 2, bad, or, you know, what is going on elsewhere, uh, if we attack, rather than having a graceful way of going back, to, as we saw going to, you know, uh, Peter the Great time, to, to uh, um, going back to the fact that we had royal family connections and so forth, going back to a period where I think where Moscow, Petersburg, Enclave would prefer to be looking towards the West rather than this gradual journey of looking towards Beijing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Elbert, for, for your presentation. And now it's time to move to our Q&A session. So the very first question is from Mr. Mensi Zak, who was the head of Russian department at the Center for Eastern Studies at OSW. And his question is, if we agree that the current status quo in Donbass is unacceptable for Moscow, as it doesn't fulfill almost none of its original goals, what we could expect from the Russian various types of aggressive moves and how it should be handled? Dr. Galiotti? Yes, thank, thanks for that question, Marek. Um, I think really what we can expect is a, a two-track approach. On the one hand, it's clear that Moscow has pretty much given up on any thought that it's going to be able to, shall we say, bargain the Donbass for anything that it wants. And, and it's essentially digging in and looking to try and make this as, as for it, cheap and um, untroubling a, a problem as is possible. And this was visible, I think, very much in the transfer of power from Surkov, who was uh, a political theatrical entrepreneur in many ways too smart for his own good, who never really had much traction in the Donbass. He wasn't that good at dealing with the, the hard men at the front line. And in they moved instead Dmitry Kozak as the, the new curator. Now, Kozak is a troubleshooter. He's a fixer. He's the person you bring in when, again, you just want to sort of things to be sorted out and settled down. It's what his role was in the North Caucasus and what's going on now. And to be honest, we're seeing a certain amount of kind of low-level reshuffling, sometimes reshuffling by bullet, 
um, of, of different figures within the Donbass. Again, they're just trying to sort of just basically settle it down. So in some ways, I think we're seeing a consolidation in the Donbass. But you talk about aggressive actions. I think what we're going to see, though, is an attempt to, shall we say, get maximum return on investment. So we're going to see, as is as the OSCE is reporting at the moment, sporadic uh, increase in local violence along the line of contact when they just want to remind the Ukrainians that there is a war going on and they want to sort of you know, create a debilitating effect. We're going to see more operations like the massive escalation of troops that we saw earlier this year. But in some ways, Moscow was then able to bargain away for a summit meeting with Biden. And again, this is the problem. Unfortunately, Moscow has been given the, the impression that it only gets something out of the West when it makes it for itself a problem. And I think this is precisely the Donbass is going to be one of its key areas where it causes problems for the West. So, again, I mean, I think they, they will just simply use it whenever they want as a lever to try and cause trouble for Kiev and by extension to cause trouble for the West as a whole. Thank you very much, Dr. Galeotti, Dr. Lanoska. I agree with what Mark just said. I, I, would, I would also add that I think there's an element of baiting that is happening here that Russia has been trying to uh, put in place um, uh, the instruments that would allow for it to go about coercion in a heavy handed manner vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. The thing is that it's not clear to me whether this strategy would succeed. Um, sure, as Mark has just said, this could um, be used as leverage with the West to um, you know, draw its attention and to um, get things like a summit and so forth. But with respect to Ukraine itself, um, I, th I think so far Ukraine has been very wise not to take the bait and not to repeat some of the mistakes that have been made by other leaders, most notably Saakashvili in 2008. Um, and indeed, the track record of coercion is actually um, fairly poor, as a matter of fact, because if you resort to these sorts of um, methods, then you're putting your opponent uh, back against the wall. Uh, in such a way that um, you're not allowing them to save face. And so, you know, there's always this concern if you back down now, then, you know, that might open the door for uh, future demands. And I think that's um, an explanation as to why um, Russia, at least with respect to Ukraine itself in the last several months, has not really um, done so well in extracting uh, clear concessions. Um, it's hard to do coercion, especially in such a visible, heavy-handed manner as it has been doing since March and April this year. Thank you. Mr. Elbert. I, I don't think I have anything more, more to add. I think there are some astute observations made already. Uh, I would just un underline the, the risk averseness of the West at the moment to collectively address this. This is the reason why you're seeing Belarus able to take down a commercial aircraft to make a, you know, a domestic arrest. And uh, you're seeing other nations, uh, neighbors of Ukraine, very worried because there is a, a Russian speaking diaspora of what Russia might do. And I think it, it, the most important comment made so far is the fact that this is exactly Putin's tactics. Uh, he causes a problem and then uses that as a leverage you know, to gain something from the West. The question is, is whether with this reset after Trump's gone and Biden is back, whether, as I say, we can actually think bigger picture and there is a uh, another perestroika moment to, 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 you know, to happen, to move us into a, a de definitively new chapter between uh, Russia and uh, Western relations. Thank you. Ambassador Bristeichel, would you have anything to add? Thank you. I, I agree with most of what was said. I hope that connection will be good enough for you to, to hear me. I'm, I'm still moving. The, the only problem is that I believe that we, we've been ricketeered by Putin. And I would put in this way blackmail to some extent. We allowed him to get in something and then he blackmailed us to get more and more concessions. And unfortunately, I don't believe that there is the time for new perestroika because he is not wishing to have any, anything like perestroika again. There is no reset on his plans. What he is doing, he is showing the West that he will be good friend to China. 
and by thus he doesn't have enough power by himself, but with China, he will be somebody to reckon with. I believe that the position should be flexible. I to, here, I agree with, with everybody who was mentioning it before, but at the same time, the lines should be really visible to him. We are bringing more and more lines as he crosses one red one lines after another. Thank you. Thank you. Another question is from Christopher Russell, who is a Tony and International Affairs practitioner at OSCE. What role, if any, do the civilians of temporarily occupied Donetsk and Luhansk have in bringing forward a new peaceful and political resolution? And how does Ukraine's stalled decentralization reforms factor in? And how can the citizens of these regions, regardless of their political opinion, be given a proper voice? Ambassador? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was one of the, our uh, tactical, not strategic, but tactical moves to offer uh, the decentralization as the somewhat when the Russians wanted to more or less uh, make Ukraine federal state with the uh, rule sort of with an idea to have better power on our foreign uh, decisions. Meaning simply, no, you know NATO. That's what we were fearing at the, at the moment. So we told them that, no, we're not giving you special sort of treatment. We're still a unified nation with just one sort of unified system. Because we understand where it will bring us. We've seen it with Moldova in Transnistria, where the same Cossack was actually doing things. We saw it in Georgia. We saw it in, in uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. We've seen this strategy be used once and, and again by Russians. They would have some region, they anchor it to the to Russia, and they would pull this strip, the, the, the rope back, back to the to Moscow. That's what we didn't want to allow them, and that was our offer. I have to be frank with you, that our offer of decentralization as the key for the regions to have more power, to so these regions to be heard in Kiev, did not was not bought by people in Luhansk and Donetsk. Not because they, they couldn't do anything, but because they couldn't do it because Moscow didn't allow them. Moscow told us immediately that, no, this is not substitution. That's not enough. You have to become a federal state. That's where the, the, the problem, where the principal problem is. How we hear the people on in the East. This is, again, very difficult moment for each and every center how to hear properly the, the regions. But our is so much more difficult because we have blood. We have 14,000 people killed from our side and nobody know how many really people been killed over the lines of, of the detachment line. We have 1.6 million people been already on the move in Ukraine. They were been sort of the refugees, internal ones. So these people we can take care of. How to deal with the people beyond the line? Difficult, but what we understand that we have to first work with the younger generation students, allowing them to become a back, a part of the Ukrainian society, reminding them they can be citizens of free Ukraine with a visa free regime and so on and so forth. It's always is not enough, but that's at least the moves we are trying, trying to do. That's what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Another question is to Mr. Elwood from Rosette Gagnon, Government of Canada. Based on your comments, as well as your colleagues, what does Russia need in return to stop the war in Donbass? Is there a trade-off action that you believe would allow Russia to back out of Crimea and return to status quo to pre-2014 Ukraine territory? Thank you. Yeah, this is the big question, which you know we, we've sort of addressed a little bit so far. What is it that what Russia would like? Uh, is it Putin himself that is driving Russia's agenda, or are the Russian people themselves perhaps seeking something very, very differently? We've mentioned you know, China a couple of times, and you cannot have any conversation about international affairs anymore uh, without thinking uh, about the influence of China, uh, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in more likely in, uh, in, in the number of years, so dominant will China be on, 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 on the international scene. Uh, that we need to factor in uh, where they go, where their influence uh, uh, impacts on, on whatever you're talking about. And that also applies uh, with Europe and indeed with uh, Russia as well. And the sooner Russia realizes that it itself will need to make a choice 
as to whether it wants to look east or west. Um, and uh, Russia and China is not a natural fit. The only thing natural about that is that they presently have a common adversary. So on the detail of, of what happens uh, in Eastern Europe, in these hot spots, whether it be the Crimea, whether it be South Ossetia, Abkhazia, uh, or, or indeed in, in Eastern Ukraine, or indeed some of the other the, the countries where there are diasporas as well, um, we need to make it clear that the NATO is not a threat, that the EU is, is not a threat, that actually there is a, a common ground, a, 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 a way that we can move forward, which will improve security for everybody and indeed uh, trade uh, and give us a stronger position to stand up to uh, what, where China is, is taking us. Now, that takes some bold moves. That requires some serious back channels, um, I think, with Moscow itself. Uh, to be able to make that case. Um, but Russia needs its own Sputnik moment, if you like, to recognize what China is up to, and actually that Europe could very much be uh, Russia's friend. Thank you. Another question is from the FCDO, but may I please remind everyone to indicate your name and your role? Thank you. So the question is for all panelists. What do you see as the most useful role for NATO helping to resolve the conflict and more importantly in supporting Ukraine? Dr. Lenoska. Uh, I've become a little more skeptical about NATO's role, to be honest, with respect to Ukraine. Um, having heard from some Canadian colleagues who are in Ukraine as part of Operation Unifier, they themselves would admit that, you, that NATO doesn't really do that much for them, that they sort of treat Ukraine as a bit of a box checking exercise and that a lot of the on the ground activities that are happening are through bilateral channels like with Canada or with the United States or with uh, Great Britain for that matter. Um, NATO, of course, is hamstrung uh, in terms of what it can provide. There are obviously several countries within its ranks that are opposed to greater integration. So they move the goalposts uh, whenever uh, Ukraine undertakes various re reforms in order to uh, prevent um, uh, uh, Ukraine from having um, uh, a clear idea of what it needs uh, to do to get actual uh, membership. And so there are all these sorts of innovations like the Enhanced Opportunities Partnership and so forth and so forth uh, that give some glimmer of hope for NATO membership. But I don't think there's any um, appetite to provide even a membership action plan. Uh, and so Ukraine does a lot or has done a lot uh, with respect to um, uh, military reforms and so forth, um, but uh, NATO membership remains elusive as ever. But uh, I think there's still greater promise with respect to, like I said, those bilateral relationships whereby uh, like-minded partners, Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom can work outside of NATO structures to deliver certain security goods uh, and other aspects of support, other forms of support uh, that can rebound to Ukraine's own success. That's not to say that Ukraine should dispense with NATO entirely. Um, I don't want to convey that impression, but it seems to me that the more the more robust route of providing assistance is not through NATO itself, but through individual members uh, themselves, precisely because of the dissension that exists within uh, the alliance. Thank you, Dr. Galiotti. Yes, I always feel here we're in a kind of territory for Hippocratic politics of first do no harm. Um, I mean, as Mr. Elwood said, you know, NATO particularly has acquired this kind of totemic power in Moscow, and particularly Putin and his inner circle, as this, this great big security bugbear. And in part because they don't see it as an alliance of like-minded democratic states, well, and one semi-democratic state. Um, Rather, they see it essentially as Washington's Warsaw Pact. So anything that looks like it's a NATO thing, they do regard uh, in, in, in much more alarmist terms, which is why I, I, I very much agree with Alexander. I think actually it's much better to be focusing on bilateral or, shall we say, sort of coalitions of, 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 of the well-meaning to provide security assistance for, for Ukraine. Um, the thing is that obviously actual NATO membership would be a phenomenally powerful security guarantee for Ukraine. 
because um, I do think that actually the, the, the Russians do regard Article 5 as being pretty much bulletproof. However, the point is that given that this would be a process, my big concern would be, even if NATO did, and it, there's clearly no evidence that it will, but even if NATO did say, yes, you're on track, and I don't know, in 2027 or 2025 or whatever, you will become a member. I think in Moscow, particularly to people like Putin, this would basically just simply be mean that the clock would be starting to have tick, start ticking. And therefore they would think, well, basically we, can, we must do something before that point. Um, I mean, on, on a very small and amateur scale, I mean, we saw this with Montenegro with the attempted coup before it, its NATO membership. As I said, that, 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 was, that was an almost farcical venture. I do not think it will be a farcical thing. If they really thought Ukraine was gonna become part of NATO, I think that they would dramatically escalate the pressure that they would bring to bear. So although I can fully understand Ukraine's aspirations for, for membership, I think it actually will be counterproductive. And we can basically provide all kinds of different assistance, but just through different channels. Thank you. Ambassador? Just, just one word. You know, despite my years in NATO and the closeness and understanding how it works, I also agree that uh, unfortunately it's not happening. It's not happening at least right now. If, it, if, it, if we can get something in the bilateral level, that's just the way we will pursue. And I believe that we here just, we were just discussing in different terms the key question. What actually Russia wants and we believe that there is something they actually need from Ukraine. I would argue that there is none. We hope at the first time, the first months of occupation of East, that that's Russia not doing to cover the Crimea occupation, that they will get out so everybody will forget it will be sort of a deal, raising hand again and then dealing with us. But no, it's not happening. We hope that the Russians will step away after MH17, saying that, you know, we would help the East, but not the terrorists who would kill the innocent people on the plane. No, Russians did not back away. So what I truly believe that Russians do not need anything, they just want Ukraine not to exist for the particular purposes of survival of their own regime. Putin can't allow Russians to see Ukrainians as a successful, almost whatever the little Russia they call, whatever they call us. This just, he can't survive politically, not just him personally, but many people around him. So instead of just looking for the way how we can police him, okay, okay. And we beg him so he will. Ambassador Pristyko, I'm afraid we lost you. Will allow us to, to live. I believe that we have seen, we can do to actually, I don't believe that Putin understands the military threats to Russia. This Thank you. And Mr. Elwood, would you have anything to add? I think we need to distinguish uh, between the benefits of advancing um, Western interests through NATO versus Western interests through the EU. They will have different impacts and be received differently uh, by Moscow. And uh, I absolutely understand from a security perspective why there's a desire for Ukraine, for Kiev to want to have that umbrella of security, not least with Article 5, as you know, it's seen as very robust, in, robust indeed. But you know, we've had big agreements, peace agreements in you know, the past few centuries. You know, I, I, I lived in Vienna in Austria for, for many years. I grew up there. Uh, my father worked in the United Nations. And you know, were Ukraine to move down the independent route, you, know, you sit between two colossal great big power bases. Um, if you are free to choose your own economic destiny, that's up to you. But from a security perspective, you know, if you've got a tacit agreement uh, from, uh, from Russia, from Putin, that, you know, you were then independent and that would be respected, you know, where could that, from a prosperity and security perspective, you know, is that something that, that you could then live with? Um, right now, it's not working. We're discussing mixed, you know, sanction agreements and, and accords and so forth, which are how many years later? The, the area is very unstable 
indeed. And that's to nobody's benefit. And like I said, there's a long term geopolitical picture at play here. And Ukraine, you are you know, at the forefront of what's happening here. Solve this piece of the jigsaw. And it could be the beginning for something much, much bigger. Thank you. Ian Grant, former UK law enforcement intelligence analyst for ex-Soviet state, is asking about the recent incident in the Black Sea. What response should NATO collectively and individually give to the latest threats to harm NATO ships if they repeat the transits of the British destroyer and the Netherlands frigate? Could this be an attempt to divide Western public opinion? For example, saying, do you want the crews to die for Ukraine? Dr. Galeotti? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is very much the classic Russian approach of escalatory rhetoric. And it, it is clear that uh, the HMS Defenders uh, transit did hit some very sort of raw nerves. My view is that generally in the past, our problem with, with, with Russia has been that we have, instead of carrying through the kind of classic speak softly and carry a big stick, we have lectured them loudly on why they should be different while only waving at best a medium sized twig. And, and in fact, therefore, although it's easy for me to say because I won't be making, given the orders, let alone being on any of the ships, if anything, I think that actually this is a, a bluff that needs to be called. Um, it's a dangerous moment, but I think the problem is this, that, that I think that I don't believe Putin is going to change. I don't believe that while he is in the Kremlin, unfortunately, we are going to see any sea change in, in Russian policy. But on the other hand, nor is Kremlin policy driven by foolishness and by kind of a, a sort of insane desire to get at us, do whatever the cost. They are deeply pragmatic. And I think that, you know, while absolutely dialing down a lot of the rhetoric, I think we, we need not to be backing away from challenges. It's really uncomfortable saying so because it, A, it makes me feel like a hawk, a warmonger, but B, also, yeah, it, it carries inevitable risks. But nonetheless, I think the risks of showing a strong front, as we saw, for example, after the Skripal attempted poisoning, um, are outweighed by the advantages if we actually show that we are not going to be cowed by a particularly inflammatory rhetoric. Thank you. Um, another question is from Thomas Klon, who is a former ambassador of Poland to Estonia and Slovakia, and also a former director of NATO Information Office in Moscow. So his question relates to uh, the latest article by Mr. Putin on Russia and Ukraine as one nation, has been interpreted by respected Russian analysts and pundits in quite pessimistic terms, including as a prelude to solving the question of Donbass through military means. Ukraine does not need Donbass, he said. Personally, I do not think you will dare to launch a major attack there. In my view, the article is part of a psychological war, both with Ukraine and the West. Um, Dr. Lanoska, would you have any comments to make? I would actually defer to Mark on, on this very question because uh, he's actually written on this and so forth. But, uh, you know, to me, there's nothing new here. I mean, we, we've known that Putin thinks this way of Ukraine. And, and so it's not really that interesting to discuss. I, you know, to me, like, it just does not move the needle whatsoever. Uh, it's clear that uh, Putin uh, regards um, Ukraine as a, a fake nation of sorts that's unworthy of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, you know, the bigger question is perhaps like, what does this all mean in, in light of the mil uh, military buildup? Um, in, in April 20, uh, 2021, this year, and you know, how, how does this all fit with the upcoming uh, Zapit exercises? You know, it, it's not clear to me how exactly this should matter. Maybe it's all for domestic political consumption uh, within Russian for Russian audiences themselves. But to me, I, I don't really, you know think much of this. It's it's obviously problematic from a historiographical perspective, um, to be sure, but but whether it actually says anything new about uh, Putin's intentions or his own assessment of Ukraine, I, I'm actually fairly wary that it says anything new, but I, I would actually defer to Mark on this. 
Thank you, Dr. Galeotti. Well, um, thank, thank, thanks very much. Um, very briefly, yes. I mean, I think that this this was a this was a classic example of of Putin doing something that he's increasingly doing these days, which is kind of playing amateur historian and demonstrating he's not very good at it. Um, and yes, venting a lot of his assumptions and, and prejudices. Two points I would make. One is we're coming up for uh, presidential uh, parliamentary elections in uh, Russia in September. And there is absolutely no evidence that Russians as a whole feel at all excited or exercised by the case of the Donbass. Crimea is different. Crimea is something that pretty much every Russian think is, thinks is rightfully theirs. But Crimea is not under threat and Crimea was not really in, in, in discussion in that article. Given that any military action would have serious costs, it would strike me as, as, as a massive gamble for the Kremlin at this time. So that's the first point I make. And the second point I'd make is that particular point, when he said that uh, Kiev does not need, or Ukraine does, does not need the Donbass, in context, he was saying it from his point of view of, because the Ukrainians are just playing the victim card. They would rather there not be some kind of settlement or resolution because they want to be able to tell the West, you know, you, you need to help us because we're the, we're the poor oppressed. And to loop this back to the, to the topic of, the, of this particular um, event, again, I mean, this is in part why Minsk is so pernicious, is because it gives the Russians an entirely unjustified basis to claim that actually it's Kyiv that is, is, is holding things back rather than anything else. So again, one, one of the virtues of not having mints cluttering things up is actually we get to talk about the facts on the ground rather than spurious uh, renegotiations and reinterpretations of a treaty which was really imposed by the needs of the moment. Thank you. And the very final question would be for myself before we end our discussion. How important is the Black Sea region and its security for the United Kingdom? Mr. Elbert. It, it, it's, it's a great question to end on because it then poses the question, what should we do? Yeah, we learned to our peril, you know, the uh, we ignore European security. Uh, we will suffer. We are and we should it also exposes perhaps the, the 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 rift between the EU focus on this and and Britain as as well, and indeed separated that to the US. There must be a collective Western position on this, um, standing up to Russia and then also our support to Ukraine as well, which must must be absolutely resolute. But we lack a strategy here, and this is what Russia is then advancing and taking it as indeed is China as well. Is the fact that there are cracks in in our commitments. You know, France, Germany, United Kingdom. There's all slightly different views on what we should be doing, and we need uh, to go firm on, on where we want to take this. And at the moment, we are tactically responding to events, which then allows Russia to guide, you know, the, dictate how things pan out. Every time something happens, we then spend a long time trying to get consensus, trying to get a collective view, and Russia throws another spanner in, and then we start all over again. And uh, so he's determined, determining the, you know, the state of play at the moment. And we need to get ahead of the game. We need to be more proactive and more resolute in having a, a, a more collective European strategy. Well, greater Western leadership. Thank you very much. And Ambassador Bristaiko, any, any final remarks? Just, just one very short. And I believe that something we can start working with when we don't know, and I totally agree that there is a lack of a sort of a well-defined policy, policy towards the Black Sea region. What we offer in, in, to our partners around the globe in the West, that guys, let us, when we don't have a policy, let's work on what we already have, so-called international law. When it is maritime freedom of navigation, please come at any time. If there are people, people's rights. Let's not forget about them. If there are some people being posted, like like Crimean Tatars, let's think how we can allow them to get back to their motherland. So all of the things which we've been as a young nation been taught by the West, we finally got it. Now what we want to West to also act upon this sort of traditional instruments at the same time while we will be defining something better than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is already 1 p.m. and unfortunately we have to end our discussion. But I would like to sincerely thank our panelists and also our audience. And I do hope that you enjoyed the event. 
We have now kickstarted our events program and we will be bringing you many more timely and important discussions on geostrategic challenges and also environmental security matters. You can check the upcoming events on our website and you can subscribe to our events on www.geostrategy.org.uk slash subscribe. Thank you very much once again and see